Hi everybody, uh, this is Dr. Lefkoff uh, with the first part of the installment today for IRGN 424 Corporate Finance here at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies at UC San Diego. Uh, in the first part of the installment today, I'm going to show you how to set up your liability, compute the duration and convexity of your liability, and estimate the change in the value of the liability uh, when we change the interest rates. So. Let's start over here. Uh, let's define our default model parameters, uh, the starting values of the liability. So let's suppose that we sold $1 million worth of a certificate of deposit that's paying a coupon rate of 7.5%. Uh, and let's suppose that we're selling this, uh, it's brand new, so we're going to sell it at a price um, where it's, it's going to be already trading at par. So we'll make the yield 1.75%. And we're actually going to allow the yield to float later on as we change it. So I'm going to add to the current yield this value of zero here, which is measuring the change in the yield later on when we allow it to fluctuate. And if you want to, you can go ahead and format this. So we're just dealing with two decimal places. Hey, notice the settlement date uh, is today's date, maturity date. I'm having this thing mature in 10 years from now. Uh, so there are going to be 10 payment periods. Uh, there was no previous coupon. The next coupon is going to be made one year from today's date, and it will be making, suppose, one coupon payment per year. Uh, given all this information now, we can compute our cash flows in each period. So the cash flow in uh, periods one through nine are just going to be given by the product of the coupon rate and the principal. And I can go ahead and drag that formula down. And in the very last period, I'm also getting that coupon payment. But with one difference, we're going to have to pay back the principal amount in the account. So you'll notice that last period, we definitely have a bigger payment that we have to cover. Uh, our discount factor is going to be 1 over 1 plus the yield raised to the T power that particular period and we're going to go ahead and drag that down and notice if I know the cash flows and the discount factors associated with each cash flow we can easily compute the present value by just taking the product of these two columns I can drag that down okay so now we've computed the present value of each cash flow which means we're actually ready to compute the nominal price of the cash flow so how do we do that well we know the price is just the sum of the net present value of the future cash flows. And you can see the price is a million dollars. So it is indeed trading at par as we set it up. The quoted price here, many times when you look at the assets quoted price, they'll quote it as a percentage of the par value, uh, which means I'm just going to take the ratio of the nominal price to the principal and multiply it by 100. Okay, and let's come over here to this gray column and calculate the weights, which is just going to be the net present value of one cash flow as a fraction of the total price of the asset or the net present value of all the cash flows because these weights are going to be important in computing our duration or convexity. Hey, recall that the Macaulay duration we can calculate by just multiplying each of these weights here by the corresponding time the cash flow is occurring and summing over all periods. So what we're going to wind up doing here is we're going to take the sum product of when the cash flows are occurring multiply by the weights and we're going to add them all up so there is our macaulay duration you okay, notice if we wanted to we could have used the excel built-in function here uh, here's the settlement date the maturity date coupon rate the yield uh, we're paying one payment per year and the excel uh, function is giving us the correct value as you can see so it is it is reliable uh, recall the modified duration is just the Macaulay duration divided by 1 plus the yield. It's the discounted Macaulay duration, but still measured in years. Um, and the convexity, we're going to compute by just taking the product, sum product of the weights and this column T squared plus T. I'll show you why we do that in a minute, and we're going to discount by 1 plus the yield squared. And this gives us our convexity value. So I'm going to just quick switch the slides here. You'll notice here is the convexity calculation. 
Okay, and what we've done is uh, we've taken the product of the weights multiplied by that term t squared plus t, so that's showing up here uh, in the convexity calculation. Okay, what we can do next, uh, I'm going to just keep track of our original price. We'll need that later on when we start changing things around. I want to track what the original nominal price of this asset was. Okay, now we can actually use our duration values to calculate percentage changes in the price. So the first order approximate percentage change here um, to the asset's price, recall, is just equal to negative the modified duration multiplied by the amount that we actually change interest rates, which right now is zero. If we wanted a second order change in the price, I'm actually going to take my first order change and add to it the convexity effect. So I'm going to add to it convexity uh, divided by 2 multiplied by the change in the interest rates squared. And again, this formula is just very similar to what I'm doing down here, except I've divided this whole line in the slide by P first. And so again, we just added this convexity term, C over 2 plus delta R, the quantity squared. And uh, now we can approximate the actual change in dollars of the value of the asset. So my change is just going to be equal to the percentage change multiplied by the asset's original value, which is this value up here. The percentage change using convexity, again, is going to be the percentage change for my second order approximation multiplied by the original value. Still everything's zero. That means the new estimated price for both the first and the second order approximation is going to be my change in price plus the original price. Okay, so my new estimated price for the second order approximation is going to be E7 plus the original value here. So notice my new price is the same as the old price because we have not changed the yield. And I can also compute the error uh, in this new estimated price. So let's take the uh, new estimated price. Um, sorry, we'll take the new estimated price minus the actual calculated price as a fraction of the original price here. And we'll do the same thing down here. Let's take the new estimated price for my second order approximation minus the calculated price as a fraction of the original price. Okay, so now we're ready to uh, allow the interest rate to change. So let's suppose we have a uh, parallel shift in the yield curve where um, interest rates increase by, let's say, 0.25%. Okay, now we can see exactly how the value of the asset will change. Okay, notice uh, when the yield changes by 0.25%, I get a reduction in the price of about minus 2.27%. Uh, which means that the uh, price of the asset is going to change by about um, 22. Why is it giving me 22,000 here? Oh yeah, it's going to change by 22,671 dollars, um, which means the new estimated price is around 977,000 uh, something dollars. Um, and you'll notice uh, that the first order approximation, the error was a little bit higher than when I actually also used convexity. Um, to calculate the change in the asset's price. So, um, we've set up our uh, cash flow spread here in the spreadsheet. Um, we're able to calculate the durations, the convexities, and price the asset, and we can also compute both the first order and the second order approximations to changes in the price of the asset uh, by using our duration and our convexity calculations. Uh, in the next installment, I will show you how to uh, take the bond portfolio that you formed, We'll link it to this liability spreadsheet and we'll actually solve for the weights in the bond portfolio that match the duration of the bond portfolio to the duration of the liability so that when interest rates change, uh, the values of both the liability and the bond change in approximately equal amounts so that the liability is still covered um, by the bond payments. Or, I'm sorry, by the value of the bond portfolio.